So this morning we are going to take on Matthew chapter 2 in its entirety. For the next two weeks, well, for today and then next week, um, we're going to deal with a couple of epiphany stories. This morning, we're going to talk about the visit of the wise men and also Mary and Joseph and Jesus' flight into Egypt to escape the threat of Herod. Then next week, we are going to jump to Matthew chapter 4, and we're going to read about Jesus' first sermon repent and believe for the kingdom of heaven is near. We're gonna talk about that next week. And then we're going to transition. We're gonna remain in Matthew, but we're gonna transition and look over the course of the the following weeks at the parables that we find in the gospel of Matthew, which I'm really excited about. So just so you know where we're headed at the beginning of this year. But for this morning, Matthew chapter two in its entirety, verse one to 23 It's on page 1497 in your pew Bibles. It will also be on the screens, I believe. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Christ was to be born. In Bethlehem, in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will be the shepherd of my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, go and make a careful search for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me so that I too may go and worship him. After they heard the king, they went on their way and the star they had seen in the east went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary. They bowed down and worshiped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold and of incense and of myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. When they had gone, An angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said. Take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. So he got up, took the child and his mother during the night and left for Egypt, where he stayed until the death of Herod. And so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet, out of Egypt I called my son. When Herod realized that he had been outwitted by the Magi, he was furious, and he gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and its vicinity who were two years old and under, in accordance with the time he had learned from the Magi. Then what was said through the prophet Jeremiah was fulfilled. A voice is heard in Ramah weeping in great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because they are no more. After Herod died, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, get up, take the child and his mother and go to the land of Israel for those who were trying to take the child's life are dead. So he got up, took the child and his mother and went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was reigning in Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. Having been warned in a dream, he withdrew to the district of Galilee And he went and lived in a town called Nazareth. So was fulfilled what was said through the prophets. He will be called a Nazarene. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So Matthew 2, I don't know if you noticed this or not. Matthew 2 is full of kings and kingly examples. You have... We three kings of Orient are. More specifically, though, it's 
kings from the east bearing three gifts. It mentions three gifts, not three kings, but who cares? Secondly, you have King Herod, the regional king of what was once the nation of Israel. And then finally, most important, you have little Jesus. Little Jesus, the one true king of all creation. And the most important question to answer in this text is, do you receive Jesus as your king? Now Matthew here in this chapter provides two choices to that question, two answers to that question by providing two examples. We have the example of the three kings or the wise men, and we have the example of Herod. And so I just want to take some time and look at each one of these in turn. Now, contrary to popular belief, the wise men didn't show up to Bethlehem on the eve of Jesus' birth. Now that looks really, really nice in manger scenes and, and you know those little things that we put up with the year. You have the group of shepherds, you have the group of wise men, you got a bunch of stable animals and even some camels thrown in. But you know the wise men didn't get there on the eve of Jesus' birth. In fact, they probably didn't arrive in Bethlehem until more than a year later. More than a year later. So truth be told, this is technically not a Christmas story. It's actually an epiphany story. An epiphany comes from the Greek word that means manifestation or appearance. It is a time in the liturgical Christian year where we celebrate new revelations from God where we seek to understand him better, where we grow close to him through scripture, through the eyes of the Holy Spirit. Now, I make that whole point to knock you off balance a little bit, the fact that the wise men technically aren't part of the Christmas story, because whatever you're feeling right now doesn't even come close to what Matthew's first readers were feeling when they were confronted with this story of the Magi. Because in a very significant way, the story of the three kings from the east in the presence of the Jews' Messiah was scandalous to a lot of people who had been waiting for the Messiah for a long time. I mean, think about God's chosen people and the threat to their story that the wise men represented The wise men, outsiders from a far off land, showed up looking for the Jews' Messiah before the Jews even knew what was going on. Not only that, the wise men were tipped off by God himself so that they could get in on the action, while Jesus' own people, other than some scraggly shepherds, completely missed it. But you know, that's not even the worst of it. Let me tell you about the wise men themselves. The word in Greek is magoi. We refer to them as magi, and magi is where the English word magician comes from. These were magicians from a far off land who were dabbling in the occult. They were astrologers who tried to determine present and future events by looking at the movement of the stars. They thought the stars had some sort of divine influence over people's daily lives. Now, in the Old Testament, the language used to talk about these people was pretty harsh. Magi were condemned as idolatrous deceivers to be avoided at all costs, In fact, a rabbi from that time wrote, he that learns from a magi ought to be put to death. So it's not just the magi themselves, it's whoever the magi influences that is defiled, that is polluted, that is deserving of death. And this conviction also carries over into the New Testament where where every other reference to magi is a negative one, has negative connotations. But you know, that's what should cause us to stand back and think, 
why is this account in there then? And I would argue that Matthew is doing something very intentional by including this account. He is trying to open our hearts and minds to the broad sweep of God's grace that was ushered in when Jesus was born into this world. I mean, look, right at the beginning of his gospel, Matthew places these most unlikely of candidates the idolatrous magi, in the presence of Jesus, the Messiah. God is able to chase down and reveal himself to whomever he chooses. No one is safe. No one is safe. And in the case of the three kings... The guys voted least likely to receive the gift of God's salvation. God reveals himself to them using three signs. The star, scripture, and the child himself. So let's talk about those briefly. The star. When it comes to the story of the wise men, the star is a pretty important part, right? Because it's the star that sets things in motion for them gets them asking questions, gets them to to pack their bags, gets them to follow. And this is so interesting because, like I just mentioned, what were the magi? They were magicians. They were astrologers. They were stargazers. In fact, there's there's good, um, credible evidence that that these men from the East actually in some way worshipped these stars as divine beings themselves worshiped them as their higher power. So they were guilty of making idols out of created things, and that's that's not good, we both know that. But, and here's where the sweep of God's grace comes in, where does God meet them? Where does God meet them? He meets them right where they are spiritually. God reveals himself through the sign of a star. In a broader sense, and you know, at some other time, we can read about this a little bit further in Romans chapter 1, God reveals himself to the wise men through creation. Romans 1 talks about how because of creation, just, just experiencing, seeing, tasting, touching, you know, what, 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 what we have in creation leaves us with no excuse. We have no other choice but to acknowledge a creator God, a sustaining God, a saving God. Either way, again, it was the star that got the wise men moving. By God's grace, The wise men somehow knew that this star was important, and so they packed up all their things and they followed it. But that said, I want you also to notice that the star only got them part of the way. Where did it take them? It took them to Jerusalem. Took them to Jerusalem where they asked the the most powerful man in and around Jerusalem, you know, where is the one who has been born the king of the Jews? We saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. This brings us to the second sign, scripture. Herod, not a daily devotional guy himself, calls the chief priests and teachers of the law to consult and they open the scriptures to the prophet Micah. And they tell the wise men, Bethlehem is the place that you want to go. And so the wise men, on this journey, seeking after God, understanding that this could very well be the most important encounter that they would possibly have in their lives, we are brought to the third sign, the child Jesus himself. And just quoting from the text we just read, after they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen in the east went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshiped him. They opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold and of incense and of myrrh. The wise men knew as soon as they saw this child, that he was the Messiah King. 
The wise men knew and they responded in an appropriate way, bowing down to worship him, presenting their gifts, which, which are symbolic of presenting all that they had to this infant, toddler, this little child, Jesus. And you know, I don't know if the wise men knew this themselves, but, but even in their gifts, God reveals things about this child, what he was gonna be like, what he was gonna do, who he was gonna become. Now gold, that's, that's the easy one. Gold is a gift fit for a king. We know already that Jesus is the king, that Jesus is the one true king of all creation. So that one's probably a no-brainer. Frankincense, a little bit less common, is a gift that would have been burned to release a pleasing smell or aroma. Now in the Old Testament, it was used in the temple to symbolize reconciliation between God and humanity. How fitting. Because it points to what Jesus would do once and for all, reconcile us to God. Now myrrh, it's probably the strangest of these three gifts because myrrh is what was used to embalm the dead. But it is instructive to us, those of us who know the rest of the story, because it foreshadows just how far Jesus would have to go to accomplish that work of reconciling God and humanity. And so... In the wise men, in the signs, in the gifts that they brought and presented to Jesus, the first half of Matthew chapter two is this beautiful testimony of the broad sweep of God's grace. It's like God is there every step of the way making it happen, totally in control of things. It's all happy. It's joyous. Yeah, that example of the wise men bowing down before the Christ child, presenting their gifts, returning home a different way so that they could keep this child safe. Beautiful. But then before we can even catch our breath, Matthew provides another account, an account of Jesus on the run, an account of innocent children slaughtered by an evil tyrant. A salvation plan that, that seems to be falling apart even before it's gotten started. Because the second half of Matthew 2 focuses our attention on the example of King Herod. King Herod represents another way that we can receive the news of Jesus the one true king. Actually, more accurately, second half of Matthew chapter two narrows our focus to the two kings that we have left after the wise men, the three kings go home, Herod and Jesus. And I want you to understand, because the same is true today as it was back then, these two kings posed a very real threat to one another. Now, the one in this story is obvious because, you know, Herod is trying to kill Jesus after all. But, you know, the other one is maybe not so obvious. The fact that Jesus threatened everything that was near and dear to Herod's heart. Now, I'm going to tell you a little bit about King Herod because in a, you know, kind of a disturbing way, Herod is a pretty fascinating guy. He was an Edomite, which means that he was a descendant of Esau, okay? Now, Esau was the brother of Jacob. They were sons of Isaac. They were grandsons of Abraham. So he's pretty close to the family, right? He's pretty close to God's chosen people. Herod was also appointed by Caesar Augustus to be the king in this region, the king of the Jews. And he actually, throughout his career, uh, developed a 
kind of addendum to his title. He was, he was known as Herod the Great because of his ambitious and successful building programs. His, his construction projects were, were marvels of the ancient world. According to commentator Kenneth Bailey, he was racially Arab, religiously Jewish, culturally Greek, and politically Roman. How's that for a broad spectrum of hats to wear? But Herod was also violent, suspicious, and paranoid. Herod was so obsessed with power and so determined to hold on to his throne at all costs that he actually murdered three of his own sons just in case they had any ideas of taking over. It's recorded that Caesar Augustus once said, uh, jokingly but seriously, I would rather be Herod's pig than his son. Yeah, even in his own day, he was recognized for his violence, brutality. Herod is a guy that seems to us like a man evil to the core. And that's why it's so amazing that, that even Herod got his chance, didn't he? I mean, when the wise men struck out to find the Messiah, they came first to Jerusalem. They came first to Herod. It was Herod that summoned the theologians and the clergy to inquire where the Messiah was to be born. Herod had his chance. He got tipped off about the star through the wise men. He also heard what was read in the scriptures. When the theologians and the clergy read Bethlehem, we must understand this as God's invitation, not just to the three kings, the wise men, but also to Herod himself to seek, to find, to bow down and worship, to offer their gifts. As I mentioned, Herod, representing the descendants of Abraham, is at least on the fringe of the inside group, and the Magi, in every sense, outsiders and aliens to God's covenant promises, both of those heard God's word. Both of those received engraved invitations to the party. They were both given the information that they needed. But that's where the similarities ended. The wise men, the outsiders, heard the gospel, loved it, chose to pursue it. Herod, the insider, heard the gospel, hated it, and chose to kill it. One commentator points out this theological lesson. Those who begin by hating the Christ child end up by hurting children. Hating God's revelation leads to hurting people. If people will be ungodly, they will also be inhumane. Think of it this way. I just read Jesus' summary of the law, so it should be fresh in our minds. If we love God, we are able to love our neighbors as well. If we hate God, our neighbors are toast. Herod is the gospel's earliest evidence of this. And that is exactly what happened. That is exactly what he tried to do. When Herod realized that the wise men had double-crossed him, he was furious. In his anger, he ordered this threat to his power base, to his position. He ordered this threat eliminated. He wasn't concerned about an investigation. He wanted to be absolutely sure. So he said, you know what? Just execute all the little boys in Bethlehem. Now you have to understand it wasn't thousands. It wasn't even hundreds. Based on evidence of of Bethlehem's size at that time, it was probably only about 20 little boys murdered that day. But that doesn't diminish the tragedy. A voice is heard in Ramah, weeping in great mourning. Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because they are no more. Herod and his actions teach us something about the world. In this story, we see in an uncomfortable and vivid way that our world is in desperate need of intervention and salvation. 
Sin and evil have such a stranglehold on creation that, that when Jesus arrived on the scene, it was like all hell broke loose. The story also teaches us just how desperate the situation is. The fall of human beings into sin affected everything, and consequently, the world is in bad shape. It's in real bad shape. It's not going to be able to fix itself, and we're not going to be able to fix it either, because unfortunately, Herod shows us something about ourselves as well. One of my favorite commentators, Frederick Dale Bruner, puts it this way. He writes, in Herod, we see in person what theology calls original sin. He's not just the terrible hated villain in this story. He represents you. He represents me. This is who we are in our sin as sons and daughters of a fallen Adam. This is who we are in ourselves apart from God's grace, all of us. Herod teaches that a reaction of raw human nature to the kingship of Jesus is rebellion. For Herod, if Jesus was the king, that meant that he was not, and he refused to accept that. And you know, the same is true for us. If Jesus is Lord of our lives, then we are not. And let's be honest. Let's be honest, because even as believers, sometimes that's hard to accept. You know, while we were on vacation this past week, I saw a stark reminder of what I thought was a good example of Herod. There was this uh, couple at the place that we were staying. It was um, probably in their late 50s. They kind of gave off a vibe of being professorial. You know, they looked intelligent and, you know... They, Really normal. I wouldn't have even noticed him except for the guy was wearing a kilt. Okay? <laughs> he was wearing a kilt. And so I, I noticed him and his wife. And once I noticed the kilt, I also, I also noticed his T-shirt. And I, I couldn't see the symbol on his T-shirt, but I could read the words. And the words said this. It said, eat trash, hail Satan. And it was jarring to me. It's like I saw this, and, and I, you know, I thought about it the rest of that day. I've been thinking about it ever since, really. And, you know, I didn't know what to make of it. I just didn't know what to make of it. But then, you know, the following day, I noticed this couple again, and he was actually wearing normal clothes this time, and the wife was looking pretty normal, too. But then when she turned around, I noticed that she had a T-shirt on, and it said in huge letters, it said, Not today, Jesus. So I don't, you know, I don't know what their background is. I don't know what their belief system is. But obviously, whether it's a, a religious thing or whether it's a philosophical thing, whether it's an ideological thing, whether it's a political thing, these are two people, two presumably rational people that have chosen to take their stand against Christianity and against Christ as their king, and they want to be public about it. They want to shout it loud and proud. That was disturbing to me. Not today, Jesus. Does that shock you? Anybody? That shocked me. It shocked me to see that, so blatant, so out there. But you know, it, it made me think too. It made me think about myself, it made me think about a lot of you as well. I mean, how many times do we choose to ignore Jesus and go our own way? How many days in the past year might we just as well have been wearing that same T-shirt? Not today, Jesus. My agenda is a little bit more important right now. Brothers and sisters, Jesus knows firsthand that our world is a lost cause without him. Jesus knows firsthand that we are a lost cause without him. So he came into the world and he came to us to do something about it. 
He fulfilled all the prophecies. There were at least three or four that were listed in Matthew chapter two. He made good on all of God's promises. He he died to give us the gift of forgiveness and he rose from the dead to give us the gift of eternal life. Brothers and sisters, that demands a response. No response is a response. No response is taking your stand against King Jesus. He demands a response. Which makes me think of a wise men example that I saw on vacation as well. You guys know I'm an early riser, okay? So I like to get up early and because my family gets irritated with me because they're not early risers, I just like to leave the room, like to go find a place to read for a little while. So I would get up early each morning and I would go to kind of the the big common area of where we were staying, where there was a... There was a bar and, uh, that also served as, as a coffee shop starting at seven in the morning. Are you kidding me? Seven in the morning, I had to wait. But you know, there was a guy that always got there between five and 5.30. And he wasn't the guy that served the coffee. He was a lowly cleaning guy. He was the one that was responsible for, for cleaning up the devastation from the night before and wiping everything down, getting the machines ready, getting it all clean. And every morning, he would go in there and he would, he would play music, kind of pretty loud for five in the morning, but he would play music and it was, it was all praise music. It must have been his own, his own playlist. And he would diligently do his work and start his day listening to praise music. Many of the songs that we sing on a given Sunday morning, only they were in Spanish. But I, you know, I picked up on it. Picked up on it. And it was beautiful. It's like every day he started his day in praise to God. Every, every day he started the day. He might as well have been wearing a t-shirt that says, Today, Jesus. Today, Jesus. I'm gonna start my day by praising and worshiping. I'm gonna start my day by offering this gift of my service and my hard work, and I am going to start the day with Jesus, acknowledging him as my king. As we close up, I guess what I wanna say is that's my prayer for every one of us for every day this year. Can you imagine the flourishing of faith and the growth in grace we could experience if we just get those priorities that we profess right in our actions and our lives? If we could just wake up every morning and say, today, Jesus. Tomorrow, Jesus. Forever, Jesus. Amen. Let's pray.